This is the Math Map Book Club, where ordinary parents encourage one another to develop an extraordinary appreciation of math. We love what we know and struggle over the unfamiliar. Through weekly conversation and exploration among friends, we can begin to enjoy ideas that seem difficult. Join our book club as we discover how math helps us to know God and to make him known. Oh, I'm Lee Bortons, and it's Wednesday, February 21st, 2024. Welcome to the Math Map Book Club, where Kirsty Gilpin and I discuss two lessons each week from our soon-to-be-released math curriculum for families with students in classical conversations communities. Kirsty, I know we're getting close because the forum and the chat lines and all the things that we've set up for the Math Map new students, which are our parents and tutors, um, is starting to get full of all kinds of questions. And so I just really want to thank you for all that you've been doing to train people and to make these resources possible for us. Well, Lee, you know, it's a, it's a team effort and we've got some really amazing people that um, love the math map and have um, been piloting with us. And so they're taking that expertise and, and sharing that. So we're certainly, we're certainly blessed um, to have people that are as excited as we are about seeing God through mathematics. So what's in store for today? So we are on week uh, or lessons. And I'm just going to address that because we, this week we were talking about something um, and, and it was labeled as a week. And I said, oh, wait, we're, we're using the word lessons. But I really wanted just to take that minute to share with our families that are on today that we are calling each of our booklets a separate lesson. So lessons 13 and lessons 14. But our goal from the beginning is that you would work on one lesson a week. And so unlike some of the conventional curricula that are out there where you may feel bogged down and like you have to just keep working at it instead of a day, you may work on one, one sort of section for a week and then you're behind and then you feel like you've got to catch up. Um, that our goal was really to create um, booklets that you could say, okay, this is our booklet for this week. And it's going to correspond with our challenge weeks. Uh, it can correspond um, with foundations so that we can all be on the same page. And within that, if we don't get to everything, we can have confidence because when we look at that map and we pop to the next, look at that map together, that when we look at that map that let's say, for example, that this is weeks 13, uh, lesson 13, we're in week 13. Um, and so it's, right, it's getting close to Thanksgiving, things are really busy. And um, mom got sick. And so we didn't get all of that book completed um, this year. But we can have confidence that we're going to come back to that same topic next year, those same booklets, um, and we're going to see it again. And so instead of having that fear of missing out, if we don't get everything done, we can rest and say, hey, we did the best we could this week. Next week, we're going to go ahead and move on to constructions. Um, and we might come back over the break and look at 13 again, or we might save that for the summer, or we may just say, we're not going to worry about that. And we're going to pick it up again next year. Um, so while we, we are using the word lessons, we do want to encourage you that our original intent was for you to have that freedom, not to feel like you've got to finish everything every week. So having said that, does anybody have any questions before we jump into our lesson specific content for this week? I do have a question. We, uh, my daughter and I were looking at the congruent sign that was being used for the uh, comparing lengths of lines. And I didn't know when we use the congruent equal sign as opposed to just a plain equal sign. If that's you could a great talk about question. that. Great. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's a really great um, thing to recognize and notice. So when we, the equal sign is always going to be numbers. So if we're talking about something that is a number or represents a number, so for example, the length of a segment or the radius of a circle or the circumference of a circle or the area of a square, if it has a number, then we say it's equal because the equals always refers to quantities that, that are the same. Congruence is, uh, has sort of a two-part definition and congruence says that I have to be both the same shape and the same size. 
So for example, I might have a rectangle and a square that are each have equal areas. They may all both be four meters squared, for example. Um, and so they have equal areas, but they're not congruent because they are not the same shape. And so all of when we have the same shape, all of the corresponding parts are likewise congruent. Um, and so there's those two parts that we have to satisfy. So that does that help? So if we're talking about the segment itself, it's congruent. If we're talking about the length of the segment, it's equal. Now, Mateo, from a lifetime of writing those symbols wrong, I still every now and then run over to Kirsty and say, which symbol am I using? So, you know, it just never ends, but it was because I used them incorrectly. It's ingrained in my head. I actually learned to do the squiggles under the line, and I don't know how, because nobody else does that. So give yourself grace and lots of time. That's why it's nice that we can come back to it and yes. over and over again, right? Oh, thank you, yes. ladies. All right. Any other quick questions before we jump in? All right. Well, as we look at lesson 13, um, we are looking at closed shapes and we are looking at circles on this page. And so um, let's go ahead and take a minute and look for things that are familiar or unfamiliar to you. Um, or if you're looking for a specific thing to look for, you could look at the top of the page and see what the difference is between those two images. And then go ahead and share. One of the circles is on a grid and one is not. Excellent. It looks as though a segment and a secant may be the same thing from the pictures. What's different between those? You, can you see a little bit of color there that might suggest like, what's different? The line so extends beyond the circle because there's arrows. And the segment okay. is actually colored in, it's shaded. Yeah. And the word sec secant is closer to the line where segment is centered more in that gray section. I see Great. that secant is uh, the line that crosses the circle and the segment is actually a part of the circle that is bordered by the secant line. What you tried to do is on the left has all the lines you care about and on the right has parts that you care about. And there's even more we could have added that will come into play as the domains get bigger or broader. So here's a here's a challenge question for you. What part of the plane is the circle? What is actually the circle? The outside line. Excellent. It is just that outside line. And we it's interesting because there's so many um, things that we think about when we compare polygons and circles, but uh polygon is actually defined as an enclosed portion of the plane. So it's all the part that's inside as well as its boundary. Whereas the circle is defined as the set of points that are equally distant or a given distance from the center. So the circle is just, just the boundary. So Kirstie and I, brought, she brought that up because we've talked about it. I We actually have in the curriculum and we haven't changed it. We'll say find the area of the circle, but that's wrong. It should be find the area of the disc. Hmm. Interesting. So over, give us some feedback over time because you know eventually uh, we can decide on. You know that's what's so great about having uh, Zoom and forums is community census and where that can go. It may not change the lesson for the students, but it could be addressed in our companion or it could be addressed on our forums, so that when people are actually interested in a question, they can see there's other people interested too. Would it, would it be would it, okay to say the area inside the circle? Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a great point, isn't it? How our the specificity of our language, we say so many things, just like Lee saying squiggle somewhere else, and she doesn't really remember where that came from. 
but somebody taught her that and it stuck. And we've talked before about how we all say four to the power of three, which really is nonsensical when we understand what powers are. Um, Do you remind us the right way to say that? Because I, (laughs) I want to practice. (laughs) I tried to be, I am trying myself because I still say it is to say the third power of four. The third power of four. Say that to the fourth power. Yeah, instead of saying to the fourth power, because the power is um, is the base to when when we have a base and an exponent, so like two squared, we two is my base or two cubed, two is my base and three is my exponent. Um, it is it is the entire expression that is the power. So the power is actually eight, um, which is the third power of two. So when we say two to the third power, what we often, I think most of us, me included, we think that that three is the power, but it's not. Eight is the power. And so it's the third power of two because the first power of two is two. The second power of two is four. The third power of two is eight and so on. So when we say it like that, we're we're being much more clear um, about our understanding. Just like if we said, what is the area enclosed by a circle or inside a circle, we're being a lot more clear than the area of a circle. So how would you, if you didn't read pi r squared as pi r squared, how would you read that with the power? There, I would still say squared. Squared is is that's a legitimate thing, but I wouldn't say two to the se- or r to the second power. You could say the second power of the radius, the second power of r, but I would go ahead and still use cubed and uh, squared and cubed for the second and third powers. But if you have x with a superscript of four, you would say the x, fourth power, the fourth of, power x. of x. I'm trying to, and actually I was talking to somebody uh, yesterday and I was reading off uh, some different uh, polynomials for her. And if you say two X to the fourth, it's not very clear whether I mean two X with a four as an exponent, or do I mean two times X with a four as the exponent. But if I say two times the fourth power of X, it's really clear now I'm communicating much more clearly because I can now see that that's different to the fourth power of two. This is why math as a language is so important to us as classical educators. And so one, you know, people ask you how in the world is this curriculum classical? It's because we recognize that the grammar of language is foundational to everything you think about when you're trying to communicate. And so an example could be for those of you who've been in essentials is something like one of our sentences that's similar to the dog had the cat for dinner. Well, did they eat them or did they sit at the table together? (laughs) it matters I think it also really matters for logs I think Kirsty, you may have just solved my lifelong struggle with rearranging things into <laughs> log- logarithmic form it's because I was saying that the foundational idea that came before it incorrectly yeah yes language matters more so perhaps for mathematicians All right, let's go ahead and look at our next page. And go ahead and take a minute and feel free to share things that are familiar or unfamiliar, something you see that's interesting, or you're welcome to go ahead and address those questions there um, about where those circles are drawn in relation to the polygons at the top. Something I find interesting is the word tangent. Like I've used that all my life. Oh, I went off on a tangent. Well, it's so interesting. It when we go on a tangent, there was one point that was connected to what was being said, but then it just shot off in another direction. Mm-hmm. So that's like a visual picture of a tangential conversation. Like, and I'm I'm not going to forget that again. It's 
it's unfamiliar to me sort of in a mathematical sense, but because I can connect it to what the word means in other contexts, then I can, anyway. <laughs> Christy, I would say since we're on this topic, why don't you talk about that word tangent more thoroughly? Like, is the tangent line on? Is it a point? Is it a line? Is it on the circle, next to the circle? Where is it really? So it is that point, the point of tangency, um, and this is where, where what we see and what we don't see um, can sometimes be um, challenging because we can only see like, clumps of points together, right? And when I say that, we have to have enough points that they have a visible length, width, and thickness in order for them to be visible for us. And so when we talk about a point of tangency, that is a, a single point, one single point, but we can't see that. And so we end up seeing the point of tangency being where there's a clump of points that are shared between um, a curve and a line. And that I think can sometimes trip us up because I mean, and I can tell you, right, as drawing these images um, with our designers or whether I'm doing them for something, you're you're trying to get it like just touching. And you're like, well, does it need to go over? How do you do that? Well, it's almost impossible because we can't see just one single point. Um, if any of you ever like playing with Desmos, um, it's, it's a lot of fun. But if you have um, a point, on Desmos that is um, excluded from your domain. And I know I'm like kind of getting off the subject here, but you you can't see it. And you could zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and you'll never actually see the hole in the graph unless you start tracing the graph. And with Desmos, it'll, it'll tell you the coordinates of each point. And so you start tracing the graph and it's giving you your X, all of a sudden, boom, when you hit that one point, It'll show you an open circle and it'll tell you that that point is not included. But you can't see that until you get to it and then it kind of zooms in and says, nope, that point's not there. Um, in this case, it would be saying, oh, that is the one point that is there. So um, it is just one point, but we don't visually ever get to see that. Um, and so, so I that to just say we have to kind of understand what we're asking for when we talk about the point of tangency and appreciate that sometimes it may not always look exactly right. It may look like it's more points than we think, or we may wonder if it's even touching one point. Um, but by definition, the idea of, of tangent here is that it is, it's just one point where that straight line or, or that segment or that side in this case intersects with that circle. Um, if it was more than one point, it would be, anybody wanna gather? If it was more than one point, what would we call it? It would no longer be a tangent line. It would be a- Secant a line? Arc. Oh. A secant line or a chord. Yep, either one oh. of those, the chords end, right? But the secants go on. So it could be um, either one of those. But when we're talking about a tangent, just at that one point, um, even though it doesn't always look like it. But address the person who said arc, because I think she was thinking of the circle itself. And that part, if it's two points on the circle, that is an arc, isn't it? it? Yes. The portion of the circle that we've cut off would indeed be an arc. Yes. No. Yeah, I guess I was thinking of two points right beside each other. What does that mean? Like what numbers between 0 0.1111 and 0 0.1111, zero one, or, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, <laughs> gotcha. That's the hard thing, right, Jana, is you're right. Like, I can't say these two points there. We know that there's, there are adjacent points, but it's impossible for us to name them. To name them, right. And, and even if we... <laughs> Even if we took and said fractions, right? What's between zero and one? Oh, that's one half. We could keep going smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Just by dividing in half. 
But what if your the- domain was just, what if your domain didn't include numbers that are in between like integers for like, you still can't. So let's take, let's say that I took a segment. I'm going to, I'm going to draw this. So give me a second here while I pull out my drawing pad. Um, While she's doing that, let me add, notice what's happening here. I don't know if it is for all of you, but um, you have just now entered into why mathematicians think it's mysterious and beautiful. Here we are talking about these common ideas of points and curves and lines and circles, only to discover we see them through a veil. that We don't really know them, and we cannot ever on this earth. And this is one more way we have, and we have windows out of the universe because we know there's a living, loving God who does understand all this. So Jana, when I look at my circle here, it's continuous, right? Mm -hmm. There's no gaps. Let's say that I took this portion of my number line from zero to 10. And I go ahead and I turn this into a circle. And so here is zero and then 10 actually upside is the same point, right? So now every number between zero and 10 could be located somewhere on that circle. But if you said, no, I only want to think about natural numbers well, then five would be on here, right? Mm-hmm. And I should have picked 12. That would have made this so much easier. <laughs> um, two would be here, one, three, four. But would 2.5 be on my circle? No. Um, and then I'd have six, seven, eight, nine. So my circle, we wouldn't even really be able, you know, we talked about this not being able to see it, but all that it would be would be 10 points. That would be it. Which is not really a circle. Which is not really a circle. <laughs> okay. It's just 10 points. It's just 10 right. points. But they're arranged nicely. They are <laughs> arranged nicely. And uh, in lesson 17, we're going to learn that that's like one of the best ways you can use to draw a multi-sided polygon is to draw a circle and then mark off your points. So we could draw a decagon now using those points. Let's say, to, we were saying, right, we know we could divide this and find one half and fourth and one eighth. <laughs> And we could keep going smaller and smaller and smaller. And now here's the part where you have to almost close your eyes and think, like, think about what does this look like? Because it's, it's so hard to visualize because even though if I could zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, I can always find that halfway point. There are, there is a, a, fraction, a rational number that's next to one eighth and is the next rational number. We can't ever find it because we could always go halfway in between, but, but the rational numbers actually are discrete, meaning that there's space in between them because in between all of those rational numbers are an infinite number of irrational numbers. <laughs> now on to page three. <laughs> so that was so great. that's where that's why we can never say well, what are the two points, right? We can't. But as, as Lee said, God can, right? That's like God can somehow see every single point, and we can't even begin to imagine. All right. So moving on to page three. (laughs) Okay, so now we are looking at some conic sections and we're doing this at a six-year-old level. And here's our, our question about area and circumference. And if you have students in foundations, 
Um, are those for area and circumference familiar? I always talk to the kids about the area being the carpet and the circumference always being the fits, like the, the polygon from the horse example in the lesson about polygons, but that's always the, the fence is the part around the circle. Good. So for from a grammar perspective, these these are a little bit familiar, right? Because we say these in our foundations memory work. At home, we may take that and now help our connect that by understanding area and circumference and the difference between them. Notice here that we're leaving everything in terms of pi. Why is that? Which is exempt? Pi? The symbol or 3.14? Pi. Pi is. Pi is. When would you want to know an approximation of your area or your circumference? When you're really buying the carpet. That's right. Um, yeah, Lowe's, Lowe's or the, your local carpet store doesn't do real well, do they? If you walk in and say that I need, I need <laughs> meter squared of carpet. So we, we do approximate and we do use that frequently. But one of the things that we're emphasizing in the math map is using exact numbers where we can. Right. And so Students as young as six are going to be seeing things with symbols and told, well, that's just a number. It's just a different way of writing a number. Just like our, um, the Hindu Arabic, right, numeral six represents the quantity six. This Greek letter pi represents that number pi that we can only approximate, but we can't say exactly what it is. So it's just another symbol. And how many of you would rather do two times 10 times pi and get 20 pi than do two times 10 times 3.14? Me. <laughs> right there, Melba, I love that. Yeah, I'm like, that's, that's me too. Like, please, let's just keep this straightforward. Um, and, and so that's one of the things that we do do in the math map. All right, let's look at our last page for lesson 13, um, which I think is really fun because this is not necessarily something that a lot of students may even see um, in the high school years of a conventional math program. Um, so how many people might be familiar with these shapes? Is there anybody who feels that they're a master? these when I had my spirograph I was really good at those I was just about to say that mm -hmm. in challenge three we just went over the unit circle and sinusoids it was a lesson on sinusoids and I needed to dig a little further so those look familiar from what I dug into what a sinusoid is and how those shapes are made with different functions of the trigonomic functions. Excellent. But now wouldn't it have been beautiful if you got to challenge three and you'd been looking at these every year? Absolutely. And, so <laughs> <laughs> and can you see how for a young student, this would be really exciting. I, that, that's always been one of my arguments. Um, for those of you who don't know, I was a classroom teacher before um, we had our children and, and I was able to homeschool. And I always felt that one of the, my biggest criticisms of conventional math curricula were that they hid a lot of the beauty of mathematics. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is say, no, look, there's these beautiful things in math. Even your six-year-old, can 
can experience them. And so now if you see this beauty, hopefully this is going to help you to be more excited to continue the hard work of mathematics. And so I think these are really pretty. Is there anybody who notices a pattern there on the top between the, the number that's in the equation and the number of loops? Well, I noticed that there is an odd number with the odd loops and an even number with the even loops, but I don't feel like I have enough information to know if that's a true pattern or if that's just coincidental. Good. And that's exactly what we do as mathematicians, right? Is we say, well, I think there's a pattern here. And now let me try this again, right? Let me look at if I had one sine of five theta and one cosine of eight theta, does that, do I get that same pattern? And so that's, there's this limitless number of numbers that we have that we can experiment with to see if our patterns hold. So that's great. So it, it looks like sine of sine three theta, there's three loops, but when you get the cosine, it doubles the number of loops. So I wonder if that's true. You think that's because it's even and or odd or because it's cosine and sine? <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. So good. I'd have to so, see other examples and see what holds true. Excellent. So I'm going to leave that there. I'm not going to answer that question for you guys because I want you to be excited to go and dive deeper into that and discover for yourself which of those patterns might hold true. Um, although there's a hint there about what we're asking for in that middle step. All right, I am going to go ahead to this screen, and I know that we've had um, a couple of questions that have come up in the chat log that um, I just want to make sure that um, everybody's got their questions answered. So are there lingering questions that haven't been answered? Did you answer Jamie's about the question at the bottom of page two? If you did, I missed it. I missed it. Too. I did not. Let me go. She wanted to know if anyone answered zero to this question about how many times it can go around. Yes, because this is the wrong question. We rewrote it for the printed version. <laughs> we caught it after we wrote this and, and put it out online. In other words, you need to be able to take a, a, a um, we need to rephrase it to mean how many times like do you measure along it. So we ah. did that. She is correct. Got it. Yay, yeah, Jane, many, way to go. Long strings, yes. <laughs> All right. I also just had a quick question about page three. Uh, just was there a reason for in the top box area for them to be in a in random order? Yeah, time 10, times 30, times 40, and then 20 pops in there. I didn't know if that was to just make sure the kids were paying attention. Yeah, a lot of things are done in order, but every now and then I'd put them out if I thought it was an obvious problem. Just because, you know, we're going to get people saying that these lower levels are too easy. And so every now and then we look, because it is, it's very patterned. It's very repetitive. Right. So it's like this now and then. Do you like that or do you not like that? Um. My, maybe my OCD didn't like it, but I'm okay with it as a mom. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of, we don't have time to do everything, obviously. There's a lot of skip counting, and then there's a lot of skip multiplying, like what you talked about just there, not what you're saying, um, like when you were counting, but in other words, bigger number patterns and things that, you know, would make OCD people like us happy, Jamie. I have a question. These are great slides. And I'm wondering if the questions from your slides are going to be available anywhere. Is that, is that something in the companion? Hey, it could be. They're, they're not anywhere. Um, but I could make those questions available in the companion. 
I've had a couple of moms asking that because they're just looking at this. I'm actually a PSS and I'm trying to be accountable coming to this. And then I'm mirroring your questions for my communities. And that's come up a couple of times. They're like, where are you getting these questions? <laughs> so of course I'm telling them, well, right here, y'all should come to the book club <laughs> or watch the recordings instead of coming to me. So we were just wondering if that might be a collection because I've got lots of just blank stares. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I can certainly kind of collect those and um, and put the, make those a resource. I'm glad that you're finding them to be helpful. And the one thing that, because uh, I know you haven't gotten to see it yet, but the, what the companion does is these kind of questions and tips and tricks are right on the very page where we would want you to think about them. So it should be inspiring even more questions in your um, seminars, as well as, you know, maybe giving you a variety of ways to think about it with, um, you know, real interested learners and, you know, more advanced learners. So we're trying to give you good questions everywhere we can. All right. It's important to remember that I don't like the questions. I don't know, even that one we talked a little bit ago about can two points, could we name two points beside each other? Like, I think the, it's it's tempting to want to try to answer questions like that in challenge classes mm -hmm. or, or whatever. And I, I love just letting the conversation happen and, and not coming to a conclusion, just let it go. But it's it takes training myself to do that because that's not the way I was raised. You, you got to get an answer, got to get an answer, got to get an answer. So or give an answer. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jana, that you're right, that that those kinds of things where they there might be the right answer, but there are answers that students can discover. <clears throat> and you did. As you were asking that, you're like, well, I know this, right? And so then just diving deeper. Um, I did notice this question. I'm just going to answer this really quickly um, about things that are in the companion. So most of the content that is in the companion or will be in the companion, um, as I just really emphasize that it is a continually evolving uh, resource, that that is primarily there for the parents. Um, we do have, there is some content that is specific to the tutors that is really designed to help tutors prepare for their community day. That is not, um, the, the rest of it is available to everybody. The part that is specific to preparation for, that is the part that is reserved for tutors, but anything that would help you with the booklets, with the math, with understanding it, that is available to everybody. So if we um, include these things, these questions, however that ends up looking in the companion, that would be available to all families. Um, as well as, as in addition to the directors. Okay, so let's go ahead and we're gonna take a look at lesson 14. Lesson 14 would be your last but one lesson before uh, the blue book. And so we're gonna talk about blue books next week and what, what assessment may look like. But we know that in preparation for that, especially for our challenge students that, um, we don't want to be really giving them a lot of new content um, and we want them to be able to have an opportunity to be reviewing and thinking and letting all those ideas marinate. And so lesson 14 is really designed to do that, to help pull together um, ideas from throughout the semester. And now we're going to explore those ideas in a new way. And we're going to do we are clear in the charts that there are, um, we, we may talk about a sketch. Um, a sketch is something that may or may not be to scale. It may be perfect or not. Um, we don't really care about um, how proportional the, something is that is a sketch. Instead, we use labels so that we can be very clear about any relationships that exist in that sketch. 
a drawing is usually something that is measured. And so we, I might say, draw a three inch line. And so I'm gonna use my ruler and I'm gonna measure three inches. And anybody that's ever measured three inches on a ruler knows that you'll be close. But right, we just talked about all of these points that are there, that the chance of landing exactly on three inches is actually pretty small, right? So there's, when we draw things, there's always going to be some um, element of error. That's why we had sig digs um, back in uh, 1D because we wanted to keep a, a track of that potential error. Instructions on the other hand are exact and, and it's really going to help us to explore relationships between things because we're now looking at exactly how things, how different figures can intersect and interact. So there's four different page sets, just like there are for every week. And the first page is patty paper. And I can see that some of you have said that you are not familiar with it. I'm gonna tell you why. It's because you're all economical and buy burger by the pound. If you got the pre-made burgers at home, you don't know what they were. Yes. So that that is patty paper. It is a, and most of it, the good ones are perfectly square. Um, and so you have to kind of pay attention to that if you're ordering it because you want to make sure you get some that's square because that, that just helps you with other things that you can do. It's a little bit thicker than um, wax paper and not quite as, as slick as wax paper. Um, it is the paper that would go between hamburger patties. That's why it's called patty paper. Um, it's like origami paper, but again, it's, it, it's cheaper than origami paper because it's designed for the food industry. So it might be $10 for a box of a thousand sheets, um, but it has enough wax that when you fold it, um, it actually makes a nice white line. And I'm gonna see if I can get close enough to the camera. You can actually see there's sort of a white line there. It is um, see-through enough Jana, that you can trace with it. So it's it's translucent enough that, it, exactly, Karen, it's translucent, but not transparent. So if I want to trace, it's a perfect tool for tracing. And so we use it um, because we can fold, we can trace. It's, it's very friendly to small hands, I think. So I think it gives us a lot of things that we can explore. Um, with small hands because I can I can fold and trace and do different things with it. Um, and if you are an origami lover, it is nicely sized for doing origami. So if you want to do origami with your kids, that's a great um, a great thing to use it for. So that's patty paper. So go ahead and take a look at this page and still think through um, what might be familiar and unfamiliar. And now that you know what patty paper is, I love that we do this even with our youngest students because in the pilot working with 12 year olds on this, they're not comfortable with a compass and even folding and lining up it really kind of helps you, it humbles you a little bit. And I think it's gonna be wonderful for kids who have grown up folding and grown up doing this and they're comfortable with those tools that their experience as they get older is gonna be very different. Something unfamiliar to me um, in this lesson were these subheadings, and I know those aren't for the kids, those are for um, us as the parents, but um, we've got PP1, the center of a circle. All of a sudden we're using letters and numbers, and um, I didn't understand the reference to those. Sure, those are references back to um, the charts, and that was just as a way for us to help crack between what you were seeing in the lessons 
and what you are seeing um, in the charts. And so I think once, yeah, I think once you look at the charts, you go, oh, that's all this, that's, that's, that's what that is. I happen to really like some of these because I don't know why one of my favorite things to do as a construction is to find the center of a circle, um, especially the center of a circle. If you only have a portion of the circle, it, I can't tell you why, but I just feel so empowered that I can do that. That you can give me an arc from a random circle and I am able to find the center of that circle. To me, empowering. Um, I don't know why. So there you go. Some random fact about me that I have shared with you today. This reminds me of what sounds like the way Euclid's elements are laid out. And from my understanding, if I'm doing research correctly, Euclid's Elements is the textbook that schools in the classical time before they called it classical would have used for over 2000 years. And all they really did was learn how to do shapes with a compass and a straight edge. And he was able to prove a lot of theorems through that um, in his book, Euclid's Elements. So that it kind of reminds me of just going right back to the way those things were written down and then taught to the next generation. Yeah, that's a great point. And we're going to talk about the compass and the straight edge on our next slide. But that's a great point that these, um, when you as a parent or with your students, when you are doing anything with constructions, this is something that people have done for thousands of years to understand mathematics. And so you're to me, it, that there's an excitement in that of being a part of millennia of tradition um, in using construction to understand math. And you're right, Euclid, Euclid started and said, well, look, here are the things that I just have to accept are true, right? Those are my sort of my postulates. And now how can I put those together to prove all of these other things? So, yeah. Just to give Kirsty kudos, when we first started putting the curriculum together, before we had it totally mapped, she went through Euclid's uh, 48 propositions and made sure they were all represented in this curriculum. But you would have to take a whole book of its own to do it in the exact same order Euclid did. So ours start off very casually and gradually with the younger kids. And then by the time you get to Transcendentals, you will have practiced all of them. So the PADI paper is probably the newest of our methods of construction. And as you can imagine, a couple hundred years ago, they didn't use PADI paper to separate their burger patties. So that is fairly new. Um, our next youngest method of doing any kind of constructions is the double-edged straight edge. And so this is a bookmark. And so I'm gonna kind of hold it up. You can see there are no markings. There are words on this side, but there's no measurement markings. It is just a straight edge. Now, realistically, a lot of the times when we're doing this, we pull out a ruler and we use a ruler, but the goal is not, is to ignore any markings um, and know that we can use just any double-edged straight edge, like a two by four, right? Um, and one of the things that I think is really interesting is that this was, somewhat polarized um, on a battlefield that um, somebody was actually on a battlefield and using a double-edged straight edge because this is something that's really portable and I can take with me anywhere and I can do these constructions. And the premise behind that is that my parallel lines are everywhere equidistant. And so instead of using my, my compass, which we'll talk about in a minute to measure distances, I could just use that that knowledge that these uh, two edges are equidistant in order to complete these constructions. Probably um, they were the ones I was the least familiar with and they are in some ways the most challenging because you really have to build on them um, to do the double edge straight edge constructions. And so that's why students are going to be practicing at age six, they're not really gonna be doing the constructions themselves, but they're gonna be practicing portions of those constructions 
developing the fine motor skills to use a double-edged straight edge so that by the time that they are approaching that transcendentals year, they are actually able to do them themselves. And then, or um, as we've been alluding to, um, and I have a couple here, um, our compass and straight edge are sort of the classic, when we think of constructions, those are our classic tools. And our compass is, is all about circles, but we're using just what we talked about a few minutes ago, that a circle is the set of points that are equidistant from a center. So when I look at my compass and I have my center, every point that I draw is going to be equally distant. So when I want to copy a distance or make sure I'm looking at equal distances, I can use my compass to draw those circles or those arcs to find those points that are equally distant. Now, true confessions, everybody, right? How many of us are really good at first setting the distance, putting appropriate paper, pressure on the paper so that you hold it so that my center doesn't move, but uh, doesn't like rip the paper, right? So you end up with this whole little circle so that your, your circle kind of wobbles um, and it becomes more of a spirograph. And then you have enough pressure to actually draw the line and it doesn't like skip pieces, right? It's kind of um, challenging, right? And so yes, are we going to suggest that you have your six-year-old practicing with this? Absolutely. Are we going to suggest that your six-year-old will be perfect with this? Absolutely not. And probably not your 12-year-old, maybe not your 52-year-old, uh, right? <laughs> it's something that is going to take plenty of practice um, to use the compass. And so again, we're trying to build that practice uh, in these early years. We're really just trying to practice the, the motor skills that are needed um, for this advanced piece of technology. So look at what, I want to reiterate what Kirstie said when she started this lesson. So see how very little math there is. This is a drawing lesson. It's an art in mathematics lesson, just like our covers are. And again, it's right before the uh, blue book. So we're not wasting time. We're using it well. We're saying there's still more to learn, but we gave them something that's not taxing on their minds. So that as they go to a challenge, they just go this way. This is that restful art week so I can have time to prepare for the blue book. That's great. All right. Now I will point this out because again, this is right. So we're all thinking this is our compass. Um, how else can you make your own compass? We've used rubber bands and two pencils. Excellent. String. String. So, there's, so when we think, especially when we want to go to scale, right? So working on my patty paper or in my booklet, this is going to be a great tool. But if this weekend... You guys want to go out and um, maybe lay out a new pond in your backyard and you want to find um, a segment that's tangent to it to put a retaining wall, right? Exactly. A branch stick in the sand, right? We can go out there and we can do that. We have the, we now have the technology and the knowledge to do that. All right. And just to finish out uh, lesson 14, uh, as Lee was just pointing out, right? How many of you would be tempted to ask where the math is on this page? How many a year ago might have been tempted to ask where's the math on this page? Right. So you've so done a good often, job, Kirsty. I think you've done a good job of teaching us all that math is not just about calculations. We all still say it. I mean, I <laughs> found myself saying it to somebody last, you know, and you have to do the math. And I say, oh, no, no. I've said that that's a banned idea, right? <laughs> um, so this is mathematical, even if it is not calculation-based, right? And so this page at the top where it says line art, um, we can practice with our straight edge. With the bottom, we're practicing with our compass. Um, so I. Again, we're just continuing 
to practice, practice, practice with those so that when our students get older, um, they can absolutely be working uh, for precision with those tools. And then just and, so you can rest and knowing, see how it just says trace down below there? I would not have my four, five, six year old feel like they had to trace that with a compass. They can just get a crayon and do it. But like Kirstie said, we still recommend at the beginning of the book, you know it's about compasses. And if you have them, sure, feel free to practice. And then what can you do with those designs after you've traced them? What would be a logical next step with your with your students? Color them in. Color them in. And you could even then go ahead and talk about different colors and what colors go together, um, right? So if you wanted with your older students, you could talk about primary and secondary colors. Uh, and so all of these um, ideas that we can take this as a launching point Right, and go and have great conversations um, and really go as far as we'd like to with these ideas. Right. So and we also noticed all these shades use oils. So you can go right from foundations to here. And then if you teach them to put little stems or down on the bottom, you can show, you know, this is how you make flowers. All right, well, we have a couple of minutes left. So are there any questions or ideas or observations you would like to share before we finish up for today? I do have a question. As we go through, I was thinking that the Foundation's Essential students have 12 weeks and we have 14 weeks of content. How would we align those? How would you suggest that we align those? So first, we would always suggest if you have, if you have a challenge student, I would align your lessons with your challenge students' weeks. If you don't, it's really up to you. I personally, would start week one with week one and I would then go through and then when I finish up at Thanksgiving um, with with week 12 um, I would do I could do 13 and then 14 and 15 are fun things that I could just do over the break um, and 15 we're going to talk about next week is the blue book so again that as with my younger students I may not even give them the blue book that might be something where I use that for myself to make some notes about what we've done well or haven't done well, or I may just use it as a, you know, have them draw some pictures, different things. Um, so there's a lot of ways you could use that blue book with younger students. So when you think through um, that, it sort of helps it feel a little bit more like, oh, I could align this with the foundations. And then week 16 with, with lesson one um, or week one of the second semester, and then go through. And again, you would have a couple of lessons left at the end, but, um, and again, those are lessons where when we get to them, you'll go, oh, well, that makes sense that those would be great lessons to do at the end of the year when we're finished with foundations, just to finish things out. Oh, wonderful, thank you. I have a quick question. Are you gonna consider, or have you considered pre-ordering for the complex in the bookstore? Or are you gonna just say, okay, it's ready and then get 10,000 orders at once? I don't think that they are pre-ordering. I think they are just going to um, open it up. I do believe, and so if there's a PSS on here that needs to correct me, that the first week or so of sales is going to be um, discounted. And they are April going to be 23rd through May 7th. Thank you. There you go. April 23rd through May 7th um, will be your opportunity to order discounted copies of the math map. And in return for that discount, they're going to ask you to complete some surveys um, with some feedback. So, but it, it, from my understanding, it is a significant discount. Is that correct, Donna? 
yes, it'll be $79, which is $40 off the regular price. So yes. So did everybody hear that? So April 23rd through May 7th, it will be on sale for $79. April 23rd to May 7th, on sale for $29. I mean, $79. <laughs> oh, I was going to say. <laughs> Don't come crying Sorry. May 8th. <laughs> Sorry, and it costs more than that to print it. So yeah. um, that would not be a good thing. So, yes. So, so pay. So, especially for all of you who have been uh, so great joining us every week, we definitely want you to know about that sale. Um, so, uh, yes, the free flashcards are separate to that discounted price. That is for attending that sales. That is with your PSS. And so that is separate to that discount. Um, and um, yes, so so this year complex is the level that is available for sale. And I'm just gonna flip back through our slide where I can show you what you get. So in that print version, you will see the cover, the contribution to the conversation, uh, the 16 lesson pages, the solutions pages. It will have those frames that we talked about last week, the math map, the invention page, the memoria and arrangement, sorry, that's my typo there, arrangement page and the careful calculations page. It will have the charts. It will have um, some extensions for conversations and games, uh, a game on the back, a game or activity on the back. All of those are going to be included in that complex uh, lesson. The Digital versions don't include all those extras. So if you um, get the complex lesson for your Challenge A student and you say, I don't know if we're quite ready for this, you're still going to want to have that print version so that you have all of those extra resources. Then you will be able to um, access digitally the fractions or the naturals or the digits um, in order to tailor that uh, any particular week for your student. And it may be week to week. You may have um, some some weeks where your, your student's just fine and complex. You may have some weeks where you want to go back and grab those, those fractions lessons. Um, but for participation and community, you really are going to need to have that full printed version. Um, that all of the things I needed to say about that. So hopefully that's that's that answers that question. Uh, Deanna, you have a question as well. I do. I'm noticing when I go through the complex that a lot of the index pages come straight from the charts. So then now going through naturals, I'm trying to wrap my mind around what part of these charts will we hone in with a six year old? Do you know what I mean? So the the charts are included. I'm just curious. We yeah. So maybe some of those index or what? Sure. So you're right that those um, I pages, those frames are pulling some ideas together that may be um, also on the charts, but uh, frequently, usually it'll pull um, from different charts, right? So I might say, I want to know something about lines that may be on two or three different charts. And now I'm going to pull it together in one place so I can see it in a different arrangement. The charts. Oh, I'm sorry. Good. No, I was just saying the charts are included, not because you would necessarily use the charts with your six-year-old, but remember, the goal of the curriculum is really to equip you as a parent. And so, while the math map itself is going to give you the really big picture of your math journey, um, having that chart available to you as a parent is going to help you say, okay, this is this is this activity that I'm doing with my six-year-old. Why are we doing that? You as a parent can look at the chart and go, oh, this is where it fits in. Or mm -hmm. this is why that question we had about um, the number of loops, right? That would be something you could go and go, oh, it's right here on the chart. So it's a reference for you as a parent, both for the math, but also it's the map, right? We really want you to become familiar with that map um, of that concept each week and to see where you are 
you're headed with your child. So um, I think it's easier with other subjects for us to sometimes see how the skills that we're practicing as our as with our six year olds are building and hard math. And so we really wanted parents to be equipped to be able to say, okay, this is what I'm doing with my six year old, but I see where I'm going. I see the end goal and I can see how I'm getting there a step at a time. Thank you. Help. Yes, that does. Thank you. And we'll keep talking about it. Keep asking those questions. We still have another eight weeks to go. So but we're out of time. Thanks you once again, Kirsty. Oh, it's excited. always a joy. We we'll look forward I, to seeing you all next week. Yeah. I loved all the chat. It was so fun. Bye. This is great. <laughs> Thank you.